Please join me in our call to worship. The Lord is making a new covenant with the people of God. The God of our ancestors liberates us and calls us by name. We are children of the living God. Holy and loving God, we give thanks that in your grace and in your love you have gathered us once again as your children for fellowship and worship. We are grateful that because of your unending love for us, we are empowered and encouraged to love one another. We pray that we might live into this call more fully with each new day. We give you thanks for our youth who are on a missions retreat this weekend. And even as we speak, they are traveling back home to us and we pray that you would grant them safety on the road and time this afternoon and this week for rest and reflection upon their time away. We give thanks as well for Libby Grammer, our guest preacher today. Give to her such grace and such strength to proclaim the truth of your word and give to us open ears and hearts to receive her ministry. All this we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught his disciples and us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome you to worship here at River Road Church Baptist. Whether you are a first-time guest or whether you have been a member here for many years, we are delighted that you have graced us with your presence, and we're grateful that you have joined us in worship this day. If you haven't already, we invite you to take the maroon binder, which you should see on the inside of every pew. If you don't mind passing that down and giving to us a little bit of contact information, especially if you're a guest today, We'd love to send you a note this week and thank you for uh, being here among us today. I do have a few announcements that I want to bring to our collective attention. Some of you are aware that uh, Jackie Dar, former uh, preschool teacher here at River Road Church uh, in the Preschool Development Center for a number of years, uh, she passed away Friday and so we wanted to to bring that to your attention. The church office is not aware of any arrangements at this time, but when we do, we'll make those available. I'd also like to call attention to our new missions pew card. Uh, If you would like, we encourage you to pick one of these up, take it home, perhaps put it on the fridge or use it as a bookmark in your Bible, not only to see all of the ways that we are involved as people of faith uh, on mission here at our church, but also we covet your prayers over all that we try to do together as River Road Church. In the bulletin insert, there is an announcement about the choir from the College of William and Mary that will uh, be presenting a free concert here in the sanctuary Tuesday at 8 p.m. There's more details on that and we'd love for you to come and be a part of that and invite a friend if you'd like. This Wednesday's a thoughtful faith community program had to be changed recently due to an illness with one of our speakers. 
So now we're delighted to, to let you know that we'll have Dr. Jamel Wilson, Dean of the School of Professional and Continuing Studies at University of Richmond. Uh, she will come and speak to us about ways that she has integrated her life of education and her life of faith. And so uh, we'd love to have you be a part of that. Uh, there are details on that in your bulletin as well. Last, you'll also see a note in your bulletin about the fellowship fund. And uh, you have an opportunity to give and we hope give generously to our fellowship fund as we seek to help persons in our community with particular needs. Hope you'll read that announcement and prayerfully consider your family's gift to our fellowship fund. And now, brothers and sisters, let's continue to prepare our hearts and minds for the reading of Holy Scripture. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament lesson is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, 
we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Let us join our hearts and our minds together for a time of prayer. 
Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. Time and again, we have broken the covenants you made with us. May broken hearts be restored to wholeness. May fearful lives be restored to peaceful rest. May compassion fatigue be restored to hopeful perseverance. Grant in us a willing spirit to sustain us. Too often we come to this moment, O oh God, with few expectations. We're hesitant to honestly acknowledge the tremendous power that we are addressing. For so many of us, our lives feel more cluttered than committed. And this routine of prayer is much less routine than we care to admit. And we're also afraid, not of you, but of what we may find in ourselves if we are truly opened to you. In this Lenten season, renew our desire to sweep away the clutter that disguises you and to destroy the walls that divide us from you and from each other. Rush upon us with all your love and strength and holiness that we would be restored transformed and put in a right spirit. Oh, how radical a thing it is truly to pray. Teach us to wait before you with hearts so open, with wills so ready to be, made, to be made yours that this time is never routine or uneventful. Guide us with your Holy Spirit who sweeps us out of ourselves in our usual ways of seeing the world and deposits us in completely new places for viewing our lives and our gifts and the people who surround us near and far. Provide us the truth deep in our souls. Show us the possibilities that lie in our hands, in our possessions, in our corporate power and influence to seek the change that you desire in the way people live and the very way the earth is governed. Free us from fear. Free us from self-doubt. Lead us from our preoccupation with security, with self-preservation and perceived weakness. Reveal through us the power of your love for all of your creation. For we are reminded daily that things are not in the shape that you would have hoped. May passion fatigue be restored to hopeful perseverance. Align our desires with yours so that in our worship, prayer, and action, your will is done. Be with us on this Lenten journey. Forgive us. Walk with us. Sustain us. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who has walked this path before us. Amen.
With wondrous love, God calls us to share of our gifts, our time, our energy, our love, and our resources, that we would take part in sharing God's love and mercy with all around us, that we would indeed follow and do what God calls us to do in every way. Amen.
my mother, who is a high school English teacher, always cracks the joke that as long as her Shakespeare exams are in school, prayer will also be in school. I admit that before every church history exam from Dr. Lloyd Allen in seminary, I was also begging God to keep obscure names and facts in my brain for at least one more hour. Some of you met him last fall. That brilliance came through very strongly in those exams. We as a people are interesting like that. We tend to pray most fervently when our life or grades are on the line. Some call this tendency a foxhole faith, playing on the old quote that there are no atheists in foxholes. Whether that's true or not is debatable, but for those of us who are believers, even the most regularly attending Christians in church find ourselves forgetting to pray up until that moment of deep despair or fear or guilt. I'm not sure that foxhole faith is all that bad. To be sure, we should be striving for a more daily walk with God, one that brings us closer to God even in our joys and celebrations, one that involves regular gratitude. But in seasons like Lent, times in our lives where we are confronted with our own shortcomings or mortality, these times bring us closer to God, a God who suffers with us, a God whose mercy overflows. And we learn a little bit more about the nature of God and who we are in relationship to God. I've often heard the season of Lent jokingly described as a 40-day guilt-ridden diet with a side of extra church services. Now, I don't think any of you actually feel that way about Lent. But how many times has this season subtly become this rote fasting ritual that holds little relevance in our lives, except perhaps to shrink our waistlines by skipping chocolate or dessert? How many prayers do we actually offer when we reluctantly turn down the chocolate sundae or the extra helping? We tend to go about our lives for these 40 days. We listen to our somber services, and yet we change very little. But a few of us, a few of us here, are facing trials in this season. These subdued hymns, these texts that call us to think about wandering and suffering, they mean a little something more this year. Perhaps you find yourself having sinned against someone so horribly that you can't forgive yourself, much less expect forgiveness from them. Perhaps you're desperate for a connection with a God who is bigger than your crushed bones as you navigate physical or mental challenges. Whatever brings you to places of suffering and darkness, there is hope of finding God's presence in this season the season of penitence, that perhaps you'd miss out in a season of joy. And our psalm today, it's one that's often used at the beginning of Lent. You may hear it on Ash Wednesday. We enter into the prayer of a deeply troubled writer who is longing for a renewed relationship with God. The psalm may be a psalm of David, telling of his affair with Bathsheba, or perhaps it's another writer attributed to David's situation. But whosoever it is, the prayer longs for a connection with God that has been lost, lost because of the way in which the writer has sinned against God. We read in verses 4 and 5 that the writer recognizes that sin is both all-encompassing and something humanity naturally gravitates toward. The writer says, Against you, you alone have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. 
Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. Sin for the writer of the psalm and for us is not something that just happens occasionally or by accident. It is something that the very nature of fallenness we are all a part of. I do think we need to be careful when we read this text to not draw any strong conclusions about original sin from verse 5. So often that ends up being used to demean reproduction or even children. But the idea of original sin can go other ways too. Sometimes we get it in our head that, well, I'm just imperfect and sinful. Been this way since I was conceived. I can't do any better. But I think the psalmist is doing something different in this verse. He's trying to admit that all humanity grows into sin and there is no escape from our responsibility for it. We are all sometimes sinful. We hurt others. We hurt ourselves. We fail to be like God. But even with all the personal acceptance of sin in this passage, the psalmist doesn't remain wallowing in despair. Prayers like this psalm, and many we pray in our own distress, are ultimately looking for hope, for something better than we've had before. Read with me verses 6 through 9. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. If you notice in this passage, the psalmist is using more language about God's deliverance and mercy and love than about sin and damnation. There's a sense in this psalm that the writer does not come in simply a state of hopelessness, but comes to a God who will most assuredly save humanity from its failings. There's no sense in this psalm that the writer thinks there's anything that he can do to achieve this redemption. No, the psalmist here is dependent on God. Doesn't spend verse after verse promising to do better as we so often do in our own prayers. The psalmist instead trusts, trusts that God will create in him a new way of living and a new way of being that transforms life, that creates better behavior so that that renewed relationship with God is possible. So what about this season of Lent? How might we reorient ourselves a little as we confess our sins and pray for redemption? I think it begins, like the psalmist does, with a prayer that focuses not simply on our own failings, but on the greatness of the God that we serve and our relationship to God. There's a careful balance of confession and forgiveness here. And I think there's a powerful God who wants right relationship with us, the children of God. I think too often I spend a lot of time in a roller coaster of faith. It's either or. I'm either in proverbial sackcloth and ashes or I'm joyfully singing. I can't seem to see the hope when I'm suffering or guilty And I can't seem to see the brokenness when I'm joyful. And I think this psalm helps me see both together. This kind of balance that God would want from our relationship and conversation. Even in our darkest hours, we do not have to feel so guilty that we cannot see hope. Something I find helpful in the process of spiritual disciplines, something we do very often during Lent, like labyrinth walking or centering prayer, is the act of trying to balance my sorrow at my own sin and my joy and hope in the mercy of God to forgive me. 
Often I will find myself spending half a walk in a labyrinth feeling sorry for myself before thankfully God reminds me that I do not walk alone. I walk with a God who loves me and wants me to help find ways to be in better relationship to God. In reflecting on this passage and other recent lectionary passages, our pastor Daniel Glaze reminded me of the third verse in the hymn, A Mighty Fortress, a song many of us are very familiar with. It reads, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. And then Daniel stopped and he asked me, he said, what is that one little word? And admittedly, I had never really thought about it. What word could fell these sins and darkness that overtake us? And he said, perhaps that word is forgiveness. Maybe the darkness cannot win because God's nature as a forgiving parent, one who continually reaches out to us with such radical grace, routinely forgives and blots out that darkness and that sin. The devil's doom is sure in our lives, and that kind of grace should give us deep freedom and joy, like the psalmist's request as he seeks wisdom and cleansing and gladness from a God that forgives the many broken ways we harm one another and harm God. Martin Luther also said, to understand sin properly is to understand the nature of grace properly. There's a vulnerability to bringing our true selves, those shadowy and broken parts of ourselves before a holy God in prayers like this psalm. Much like we began this Lenten journey with ashes smeared on our forehead or our hands to remind us of our imperfect and mortal humanness, we continue our journey by examining who God is and who we are in relationship to such holiness. What if the 51st Psalm became our penitential prayer? What if when we face our deepest transgressions or our despair about our own brokenness, we prayed for restoration of relationship to a God of mercy? Yes, we take our deserved blame, but we simultaneously embrace a God of love who wants to forgive us. One of the most powerful lessons we can learn as a people of God is that our penitence is not simply our remorse for what we've done wrong. It is about recognizing that we are not God, and we never can be. Our sins are a natural consequence of our trying to play God in our own lives, and often royally messing up. Like David playing games and trying to be God in his circumstances, attempting to gain Bathsheba by underhandedly, underhandedly having her husband murdered in battle. We often find ourselves trying to control our own lives in ways that come sometimes with dire consequences. Now, probably most of you in here have not murdered anyone, but I know too many stories, my own and others, of those who have attempted to run their own lives by their own meager sense of wisdom, only to find out that without listening to the voice of God, whether directly in the movement of the Spirit or through God's children, end up making horrible decisions that they don't feel like they can come back from, or that leave them so empty there is so much healing to be done to make them whole again. Though it's a relatively minor example of error, I remember making one such decision as a small child. I was a collector of small objects, 
ranging from the least important road trash to a rare ferry cross dug up at the creek, to interesting coins, to $2 bills. I had a wonderful little chest I kept everything in. But one day I made the poor decision to take a small gold trinket from a discount store bin and slip it into my pocket. Hours later, my dear sister ratted me out as I played with my new treasure. And I was promptly returned to the store to deposit the trinket back into the manager's hands and apologize. I was so deeply ashamed, caught in the act of sin. My parents suddenly couldn't trust me anymore. And they probably felt, felt a little bit like failures themselves, which led to their pain. I spent a long time recovering from that event. Even in my small child's brain, I knew I had failed my parents and my God. I had been told stealing was wrong at home, at church. I knew better. And still I chose the wrong path. I never stole again. And perhaps I now come across a little bit as a compulsive rule follower. Don't talk to Will about that. <laughs> but I figured out, even at that young age, that my own brokenness caused harm and hurt to others and to God. And no trinket was worth that. Losing that relationship with my parents, even momentarily, broke my heart. And I know it broke theirs. I think God feels this way each and every time we sin. We break God's parental heart and make God wait for us to turn back to right relationship. We cut ourselves off from that parental sweetness we have with God, that deep connection. And we do that with the sin that we inflict on that relationship, from the smallest to the most egregious. And without genuine remorse, and without a deep understanding of the grace-filled nature of God, we cannot regain that sweetness. We must offer our confession, and we must trust that God will create in our hearts a right spirit and blot out our sins. What if Lent is not simply about giving up something, but about gaining hope in a God who makes eternal promises to us, loves us unconditionally, and desires a relationship with us? What if our prayer was not simply, I'm sorry for my sins, but do not cast me away from your presence. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. God desires reconciliation and relationship with us. We are given covenant after covenant, promise after promise, from a rainbow to a chosen people to a new covenant in Christ. And still, still we sin, still we fall short, and we push God away. And yet there God is, arms open wide, welcoming us home in an abundance of mercy. As we heard in our gospel text, it is not our own lives that matter most, but our lives in Christ. This new way of seeing our Lenten journey helps us to remember. We are not God. And when we try to be, we will fall into sin every time. Thankfully, the nature of God is one of mercy toward us. We are God's children, and God is our loving parent. In this season, yes, we do focus on penitence. We ask for the forgiveness of sins, but we should also remain deeply grateful for a God who seeks relationship with us and offers freely forgiveness and grace. We are a fortunate people to worship such a God. The new point of view we have might make that Lenten journey a lot less about ourselves and our lack of dessert and a lot more about a God who seeks after us 
in covenant relationship. May we seek after God in the same way God seeks after us. Amen. If you are interested in joining this family of faith, we're going to enter a time of reflection and response. Feel free to come forward and our pastor will meet you up front. Let us hear a word from St. Patrick, whose feast we celebrated just this weekend, who reminds us that Christ is with us today and every day. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me. Christ to comfort me and restore me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ in the hearts of all that love me. Christ in the mouth 
a friend and stranger.